he was so much bigger than me in terms of the level of malicious intent. I mean, for anybody to think that they have a chance against that, I was the bright blonde hair and blue sailor suits and you do what you're supposed to do. You know, when you're nine years old, I didn't know anything about anything. I mean, I lived on a farm. We had the dogs in the river and homemade biscuits and life was wonderful. That is very different than when Fisher was working on some 14-year-old on the training bench, and if you're 14 and every other cell is a hormone, and he twists that, you know. I mean, he was very, um, he, he knew how to push buttons and manipulate, and he would use whatever was available. Fisher was the athletic trainer for the football team. What a great place for a pedophile. Back to did they know? Yes, they knew. Do you let a pedophile be the trainer after everybody, after many people raised red flags? Willingly allowing Eddie Fisher to remain as the football trainer. That is a pretty willful act. We lived out on John's Island. My parents were worried about my sister coming home after football games late, so Fisher comes out and brings my sister home. I mean, we, we, have, we had this sort of open family where, you know, oh, it was a very, I mean, we just take people in. And Fisher was from an old Charleston family. He was funny, he had a Porsche, he was, a, you know, a lot of talk and Mr. Cool. It was just my parents thought the world of Porter Goud. My brother had gone there. You know, it wasn't in the realm of their imagination that this evil monster was a Porter Gown. It just, um, yeah, so I was like in the sixth grade, which I was younger than most of his other victims when it began. I didn't know what was going on. Back to, you know, I remember Porter Gown's attorney who graduated from Porter Gown saying, well, you know, the next morning, why didn't you go downstairs and tell your parents? If you'd broken your arm, you would have told, you know. What do you say? You know, what words would a sixth grader use to, oh, may I have some coffee? And by the way, my, this teacher put me in his mouth. I think Fisher and I were a collision course. I mean, there were so many differences about his involvement with me in some ways than in, with others, um, in that he told me about other people. Um, like a, a good friend of mine who had happened to, he thought he was the only one. Because he couldn't imagine that our lives were as crazy as his life. And I mean, I almost don't know which one would be worse. Because he was thinking, wow, what is it about me that makes me so crazy that the f four of us can have dinner at Fisher's house and he's doing this to me, whereas I knew Fisher was doing it to everybody. The crazy thing is, the way that I responded was to start drinking. 
I was very young. I mean, thank God I started drinking because it anesthetized. I mean, if I hadn't, I don't think I'd be here. I mean, Good Friday, my 10th grade year, I, had, I was failing. I was trying to get kicked out to get away from Port Gallup. My parents were like, we're, you know, they were doing everything they could so that I could go to this good school that everybody thought was a great school because they valued education. I mean, they were above and beyond. I mean, at one point, Major Alexander, the principal, came out to my parents' house and had dinner and said, I think Gary should go off to boarding school. I mean, I think in a way, that was him trying to say, get Gary out of here. But my parents were like, we don't want him to go off to boarding school. We love him. We want him with us. So in trying to get kicked out, and I was failing, so I had forged my report card the whole year. And finally, by like, it was Good Friday and report card weekend, and I was gonna have to tell my parents I was gonna have to repeat the grade. So I, um, I was gonna kill myself. You know, my mother's response to Gary's in trouble, oh, call Fisher, and Fisher will come. He made himself the person who solved problems for people. So it just kept getting deeper and deeper, and it was like the more trouble I got in, the more you needed him. He made it happen that you got in more trouble. The more I drank, that spiral just kept going down. I do think Fisher and I got locked in this. It was like, I was locked in a course of, I've got to do something about this because, you know, I finally got kicked out of Porter Gown. Um, it was six weeks before the end of school. Um, they said, you're so bad, you can't come to school. You know, we don't want you around our students. Um, in that interim, Fisher told, uh, I mean, Fisher took a student from the school to his house, molested him. The student went and told his parents. His parents went to the school, told the school. The school said, oh, we'll handle it. And Fisher called, I mean, I had been struggling for all this time to get kicked out of Porter Gout and go to college prep which my parents were like, why would you want to go to that? I'm finally, I'd already done the paperwork to go to college prep. I'm like, oh, I'm finally getting away from him. And Fisher calls me and says, that son of a bitch, blah, blah, told on me and I'm getting fired. And then he says, and I'm going to teach at college prep. Well, I ended up going to college prep and I mean, I got there and Fisher got there and everybody was like, oh, you're both from Porter Gowd but I didn't speak to him. I remember sitting in the, in his guilty plea hearing, and I heard, I mean, there were people from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, and it was the same story. I mean, he used the same lines. And sitting in that court, I mean, I realized he was so much bigger than me in terms of the level of malicious intent. I mean, for anybody to think that they have a chance against that, I didn't really realize that. His single-minded focus and determination to be a predator was beyond anything that a 13 year old could think through, respond to, had any idea what was coming, the way that he played on people's strengths and weaknesses. And I mean, that was just so far out of my realm of.
my parents kept a case of liquor under the stairs. And I just early on started, I would take the whole bottle instead of drinking out of the liquor cabinet. So I'm EYC, Episcopal Young Church. And one Sunday, I'm drinking bourbon in my room all day. My father takes me to youth church youth group. I don't remember getting there. We were watching some movie at EYC, and I come out of a blackout at the end of the youth group, and everybody's like, what is your deal? I mean, how do you... It added another layer of different bad secret. But thank God for bourbon. Because what do you... I mean, if I had had to feel that, I mean, that's why people kill themselves. I... So, but then... Um, you know, then when you're a ninth, I did my ninth grade science project in Fisher's class on teenage alcoholism. So talk about it, if people were paying attention. But he was the teacher. I mean, and then the more you, the more it happened, you know, and he was giving us quaaludes. So, because he had this friend who was a doctor who would prescribe them, I mean, he didn't take them, but he, so you just got into that, and then, um, I mean, like, by the time I had gotten kicked out of Porter Gout, and we were both at college prep, sen junior and senior, I mean, I drank all, every day, and so it's really hard to be a s junior in high school drinking every day and function, um, and you certainly don't develop I mean you know that never occurred to I mean when you're fighting as hard as you can like a salmon going upstream just to get through the day you know doing well on a test or thinking I should take this so I can take that so I can be a chemistry major that is I mean, that never came up the summer after I graduated from high school, I went to treatment at Baker. Um, Fisher took me to treatment. I mean, after that night when I had blacked out and Fisher and I went out to my parents and he told them um, I had a drinking problem, but he knew what to do about it and he would handle it. And so, there, you know, my parents, oh, we're so relieved that you're you know, we don't think he's got a problem, but thank you for assuming this responsibility. Um, I went to treatment. Um, shortly after I got out of treatment, I went to Porter Gowd and told Major Alexander, you know, you son of a bitch, I know you know what, what Fisher's doing. Because I, I went to treatment and said, oh, I don't want anything to do with him. You know, get me away. Now that I've quit drinking, I don't have to. I, I could. It, it, every time I would drink, then you get in trouble, then you need him to rescue you. And he played on that. So I go to treatment, 28 days, stop, you know, two weeks into treatment, write him and tell him to go to hell. Um, the day I get out of treatment, he pulls up in front of the hospital to, to take me home. And I just, you know, burst into tears in the parking lot. Um, started drinking again shortly thereafter. I mean, it took about a year before I could, because I would stop drinking and then I would be sober for a month and then feel and then. One of the people that worked there, I just cared so much better and I mean years later when this all came out she was like oh you know we felt so bad but we just couldn't say anything I mean I remember her saying that to me
years later, I go back to Portugal to tell Gordon Bondurant, you're new, you weren't a part of this, this is what happened. I went and told Mage, I knew, you know, call him, check it out. He did call Mage. He acknowledged later that he called Mage and checked it out. And, you know, three years later, I go back in 97 and say, enough. But until you are actually willing to go to Debbie Herring Lash's office and, and sign a piece of paper knowing you're going to have Gedney Howe or somebody similar going through your whole life saying, well, you know, you've smoked pot and taken quaaludes and Porter Gout is wonderful. I mean, that's a pretty daunting risk-benefit analysis for a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 20-year-old, 32-year-old, why'd you wait so long? It was pretty clear who was being protected. The school was much more interested in protecting A, themselves, and B, the teacher. I mean, it came out in court that Alexander had dirty secrets, the principal. So, I mean, Fisher had the goods on him, so he couldn't do anything. You know, I do think at Porter Gout, I think it got so out of control. I mean, it must have been really crazy for Alexander because I think he knew what was going on and you would have to wonder, oh my God, is it going to blow up today? But you couldn't get a fire extinguisher. I mean, so I think that dynamic was different at Porter Gout, but predators will use whatever blackmail is at their disposal. I have to give Greg Myers just so much credit. Um, he was and is amazing. I had told many people. You know, I, he was the first person I told that said, okay, let me take this information and do something with it. So that was a huge shift. And he got this information. He started doing with it different things. His law firm threw up obstacles and he didn't say, okay, well, you know, he kept going. That was a huge turning point. Greg was on the school board. He wrote um, the school district. Fisher was still teaching. Fisher, um, it hit the news on a Wednesday night, and Fisher was meeting a young boy every Saturday to tutor him. And this boy's mother picked him up from school and said, did this happen to you? And he said no, and then two days later, yeah, it did. So he was the current, I mean, it was still going on. I can either hold the beach ball underwater and not live the rest of my life, or I can let the beach ball go, deal with the consequences, and have a chance at life You know, this, this does happen. Abuse happens. It happened in 1950. It happened yesterday. Um, 
it can unravel and cause lots of damage, or you can stop it, and interrupt it, and limit the collateral damage. Why was I willing to do this? You know, if you can stop the collateral damage here, as opposed to 18 years later, that makes a huge difference. And you, if you spare one child, I mean, people don't have a clue the ripples from one job. So you stop one source of ripples, and that is huge.